And with that, I welcome Giovanna. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, Simon, for inviting me. It's uh, really amazing to be here and uh, speaking next to this uh, prominent uh, keynote speakers whose work I really admire. Also, I should apologize with, for my poor health, and uh, thank you for being so concerned and kind, and also thanks to Rene and Kelly who you know, offered uh, to help me if I needed it. Right, okay, so um, ah, yes, I want to say something about the title of this talk, because I, was, um, I kept changing it, and then finally settled on this one and thought, yes, okay, good. And then shortly after, I realized I gave a, a talk with exactly the same title a few months uh, before. Uh, and I actually think some of you have heard that talk, but it's not the same talk. Uh, yes. Just, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so there is some overlap, but uh, I, I, have, uh, I keep working uh, mainly on the later ideas. And uh, I should say this, uh, some of the things I'm going to say are still in progress. I don't know if in progress is a bit optimistic, maybe in process or in flux. Okay, so um, the context of my talk, maybe not surprisingly, is the uh, field known as, um, well, the situated approach to cognition, which, uh, well, we've heard a lot about it already. Um, there is a um, handbook, the, sorry, the Cambridge Handbook uh, of Situated Cognition that was published uh, in 2009, uh, which uh, really shows how eclectic and diverse this field is. Um, it's really, it's not a unified field. I think the best way to understand the, the term situated cognition is an, a, as an umbrella term that refers to different views, different but related. And these are views that claim that cognition is uh, embodied, embedded, uh, and active, extended, distributed. And I'm really glad that uh, Evan yesterday already said quite a lot about all these views. So, um, what, uh, what do these views have in common? Well, they have in common uh, at least one thing, and this is the idea that cognition is not all in the head. This is the, the shortest way to put it. And uh, it's a bit of a strange claim to say, you know, cognition is not all in the head. You might wonder where should we locate cognition at all. I think the best way to understand this claim is uh, to refer to the physical realizers of cognition. So the assumption is that cognition is somehow material, is realized materially materi in the material world. And then the question is, well, which are the parts of the material world that realize cognition? And supporters of the situated approach claim that these material realizers are not all in the head, that brain activity does not uh, um, exhaust uh, the physical realizers of cognition. We also need to look at physical processes that go on in the rest of the organism, and even physical processes that go beyond the, the skin in, in, into the environment in the world. So I've been a kind of big fan of this approach ever since my PhD, but uh, there is something that uh, I've always found a bit surprising, which is that, uh, well, there's a bit of suspense here, well, there is a bit not very much uh, in this approach about affectivity. So if you look at this uh, handbook, it's, it's a very thick handbook, it's, I think, 26 chapters, and there's only one chapter on affectivity, and that's actually the chapter by Paul Griffiths and uh, Andrea Scarantino, which is titled Emotions in the Wild the situated perspective on emotion, which is a really nice paper. I would uh, definitely recommend it. And part of the project, what I'm doing now, is trying to develop and build on their initial insights. So the uh, field of situated cognition, in, in this sense, I think, is still a bit uh, traditional. Maybe there is a kind of hangover from the long dominant idea that cognition is mainly some kind of rational problem-solving activity. Even in the field of situated cognition, cognition is often understood as distinct from emotion and affectivity more generally. Um, please bear with me, I'm going to say shortly what I think of the relation between affectivity and emotion, but for now I hope uh, uh, just to rely on, on your intuitive understanding. So often the idea here is that cognition itself is affect-free or not affective, and at most is, it interacts with affective and emotional processes. So in my own work, I have argued against that view. I have tried to argue that cognition is not distinct from affectivity, 
Uh, I think that affectivity literally permeates the mind, it imbues the mind. And that includes also traditional cognitive capacities, that is those tr cognitive processes that you read about when you open a handbook of cognitive science, perception, learning, memory, decision-making, planning, executive functions. I'm not gonna provide any argument here today, I just want to tell you something about where I'm coming from. Um, but uh, just very briefly, what I've done in my previous work, and I suppose I, I should say this is the shameless advertising, but uh, I just thought, given that it's my only book, I might just as well put it up there. Um, and the second one is gonna take a long time, so. But, uh, so, an active, con I, I've been a very big fan of an activism in the way that Evan in particular, and originally also Francisco Varela and Elena Roche has developed it. And it seems to me that if you understand cognition in, in, in the way that Evan understands it in that an active way, then you get affectivity for free. So I think an active cognition is inherently necessarily affective. And I've tried to uh, develop this view in, in, in that book. So let me say very briefly what I mean by affectivity. Uh, I think affectivity is a more general phenomenon than emotion, uh, emotions. I used to say, you know, in my PhD thesis, I said things like cognition is emotional, and I found that people usually reacted quite strongly to this claim. Maybe because for some people at least, maybe, maybe well, it depends also what your native language is, but the claim that cognition is emotional often suggests that when you're doing some kind of cognitive activity, you have to be in a kind of strong emotional state, or perhaps even a state that can, that can be uh, classified with the emotion labels such as happiness, sadness, fear, anger, uh, jealousy, etc. So I definitely don't want to say that you know we are always in a kind of categorical emotional state. So. That's why I prefer to say that cognition is inherently affective, where affectivity, I think at its most general, is a kind of lack of indifference. So I think we are never indifferent to what we are doing. We're never indifferent to our own condition and to um, the, our environment. So in more positive uh, uh, terms, we might say that uh, affectivity is a kind of concern, care, interest, sensitivity, again, to one's own condition, to the environment. And so from this perspective, traditional cognitive capacities such as perception, attention, uh, learning, etc., they are, I think, manifestations of this pervasive dimension of affectivity and interest and care. So they are forms of affectivity, just as the more traditional affective states such as emotions and moods and perhaps desires and motivations are. So I don't think there is a difference in kind between uh, uh, cognition and uh, uh, emotions. They are all manifestations of this primordial, fundamental dimension of affectivity. Okay, so this is just a kind of little uh, um, introduction to my, my worldview. I just now want to introduce my talk, and I love this little slide, <laughs> this transition. <laughs> it's a bit corny, but I like it. So <laughs> what, uh, what I'm going to do in this uh, talk, well, my, the Gandhi question um, for my current project is the following. How is affectivity situated in the world? So since I published my book, I realized that I had been very much concerned with the body and not really thought very much about where the body is and with what the body interacts. So ever since uh, I've tried to pay a bit more attention to the world, and um, I think there is, of course, a trivial and controversial sense in which affectivity is situated, and that's, you know, of course, we, as we go around uh, and bump into objects and things and people, these things bring about changes in our affective states. So uh, maybe this can be uh, represented with this uh, little drawing, so he's a little happy person, which, you know, Somehow, something happens in the world which changes her affective state. So that's, that's quite uncontroversial and, uh, and obvious, really. But it seems to me that uh, we can say more about the situated nature of affectivity, that there is a, a complexity in our relationship to the world that impinges on our affective state that is worth exploring in more detail. And that's what I'm trying to do now. So I'm going to talk about this uh, in the rest of the talk. So what I, gon I want to do first, I'm going to talk about the idea that we scaffold our affective states. And uh, the, the term scaffold has already been mentioned by, by David, by Evan. I think it's an extremely uh, productive and useful term to talk about our interactions with the world. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna first uh, focus on this notion. 
And then what is perhaps even less trivial, I don't know, I'll be curious to, to know what you, what you think. I want to also suggest that affective scaffolds can become what I say phenomenologically incorporated. And um, I'm gonna explain in detail what I mean by that, but roughly for now you can uh, understand this meaning, it, you know, they, come, they can become experienced as part of oneself. And I'm gonna then conclude my talk uh, with some general outstanding questions that I have for my own project and that I actually think many people here would be able to um, answer or at least uh, give me uh, some directions uh, on how to go about answering them. Okay, so maybe first, uh, well, a qualification first, because of course I said, uh, well, so, sorry, the question here is how effect is affectivity situated in the world? But of course the world is a, is a massive thing. There are people, nature, artifacts, spaces, buildings, institutions, norms, laws, culture, society, um, and of course I'm not gonna talk about uh, all of these things. In fact, I'm gonna have a very narrow focus, also in line with the theme of the conference. I want to talk about material objects in our vicinity, that is, objects that we can actually manipulate and with, with what we can uh, do things. So my guiding question is then, how should we think the relation between material objects and affectivity? Uh, how is affectivity situated in the world of material objects? Okay, so, Moving on then to this idea of scaffolded affectivity. So this, a scaffold is of course literally a structure that uh, um, people build around buildings when they want to improve, uh, enlarge, uh, somehow uh, better the, the building, and of course also when they want to build it from scratch. And interestingly, this notion of scaffold has recently been uh, adopted by many disciplines to say a variety of things. And in philosophy of cognitive science, it's now quite, uh, quite popular. So um, there is talk of uh, scaffolded minds or scaffolded cognitive states. Uh, what is meant by that typically is that cognition is deeply environmentally supported. I think that's how Sterelny, Kim Sterelny puts it. But Andy Clark talks a lot about scaffolds, and as I said, we've heard this term already by many others. There is, of course, also a tradition in developmental psychology, Vygotskian developmental psychology that talks about uh, adults and how um, adults can provide scaffolds for children and the learning process. But I'm gonna focus here on how Sterelny talks about the scaffolded mind, and he says things like the following. He says that we engineer our environments to enhance our cognitive capacities. So he, he refers, of course, to the, the fact that we build tools of all sorts to, to be smarter. So things like uh, telescope, maps, uh, watches, uh, clocks, uh, um, calculators, uh, etc. And the way he also puts it, he says that in so doing, we build epistemic niches. We build relations with the environment that enhance our epistemic uh, cognitive capacities. And of course here the reference is to the notion of niche construction in biology. Um, the idea is that organisms, uh, generally they, um, many organisms manipulate, do changes to the, their environment, which then change the organism, improving their fitness, and these changes are often, um, they are transmitted from generation to generation. So Sterelny uh, draws a distinction between a kind of more physical niche construction, something like the beaver's dam, the, the beaver makes dams, which then change the behavior of the beaver and its uh, capacity to reproduce. Uh, but he says we as human beings, we are incredibly good as, uh, as, as doing epistemic niche construction and we are probably the only um, uh, kind of organism that does that. So what is really important in this idea that I'm, I'm gonna come back to is the idea of mutual relations. So the organism does something to the environment which then feeds back onto the organism and in this case in particular enhances, uh, well in the case of epistemic niches, their cognitive capacities. So I think this is all very interesting, but again, there is a kind of affective blind spot, I think. And um, so what I've done with my colleague, Joel Kruger, who uh, was here, some of you might have heard his talk, we've argued actually that we don't only manipulate the environment to build epistemic niches, but we also build affective niches. So we engineer our environment to enhance our affective life, and in fact, it's not just to enhance it, but uh, we, more generally, I think we uh, manipulate the environment to regulate our affective state. So sometimes we want to, say, feel more. Sometimes we want to uh, feel less or um, you know, calm down, say. Sometimes we just want to keep a certain affective state as it is. And um, 
Um, I don't know if you know the work by the psychologist Bob Thayer, who has written on, uh, particularly on moods and the self-regulation of moods. And he uh, has a very nice work in which he talks about all the many ways in which we regulate our mood states, in particular our states of tensions and energy by doing things in the environment. So I think he has a very scaffolded view of affectivity, which I think also goes a bit against the trend in, uh, in psychology of emotion today, and in particular the psychology of uh, self-regulation, emotional self-regulation, which is very, which is dominated by cognitivism. So emotional self-regulation in psychology refers to a sorts of, all sorts of strategies that we apply to uh, regulate, uh, up-regulate, down-regulate our emotional states or our mood states. And often the tendency in that literature is to uh, to say that we, you know, the strategies that we employ uh, are mainly cognitive. They don't really have to do much with things we do in the world. So we might want to, you know, we might try to reevaluate a certain situation. You know, I want to try to think of something else, uh, distract ourselves, turn attention to something else. These are all kind of internal cognitive strategies. But I think there is a lot that we also do by just going about in the world and acting, which is part of the process of self-regulation. And I think this is a very nice example of affective scaffolding. And um, once, you start, I mean, once I started to think about this phenomenon, I just started to see it everywhere. There are so many different examples of affective scaffolding. I know we can begin with the um, coffee and cigarettes, and uh, so just to mention some legal drugs, but those of course are things that we manufacture and then we, well, we swallow to change our physiology, but we don't need to you know, just swallow things. There are lots of things that just stay outside and uh, uh, change our affective states from the outside, so of course music is a really good example. Think of all the portable technologies that we have today to uh, regulate our affective state. You know, we, you know, we see people with their headphones on all the time. Um, you know, how many of, of us uh, use music to calm down or music to energize themselves? We also put music on to create different affective atmospheres. And again, my colleague Joel Kruger has written a lot about how music literally entrains our organisms and thereby our affective states. I also have, um, just to kind of uh, advertise Exeter a bit more, I have a um, colleague, a music sociologist, Tia Denora, who has written a really nice book called Music in Everyday Life, in which she really shows the incredibly widespread use that uh, we make of music to change our affective states. We are ourselves, but also other people, of course, to control uh, uh, the affective states of others. Then I have here this lady with this nice red coat um, and a handbag. So here I'm thinking of work in, sociologist about, uh, in sociology about the role of accessories and clothing and handbags to regulate our affective state. Um, so there is a really nice book by the French sociologist Jean-Claude Kaufmann about the handbag, and he has... Uh, um, he has uh, um, he has a website where he puts on questions and then people get back to him with, with their own stories. And he's asked, not just women, but mainly women answered, he's asked about the people's relation to their handbag. And uh, he's found you know, an incredible <laughs> repertoire of reports that are about affectivity in so many different ways. So from starting from how you know, people fall in love with the handbag when they see it, and they love how it looks, they love how it uh, feels in, to the touch, they love how it smells, but then of course there are the whole contents that one keeps in the bag, um, people talking about uh, old cinema tickets, uh, um, pictures of loved ones, people even talking about uh, just objects, like one woman talking about heavy stones that she keeps in her hand, head bag because she loves the weight and she loves to touch those stones, she loves the feel of it. Then there is also the whole thing about how a handbag looks on someone and how you know, the image that it projects. So there is a whole world of affectivity in the handbag. And I very much like this example because the handbag is so portable, right? So it's a really a kind of affective regulator that one can carry uh, with oneself around quite easily. Um, so then, I don't know, we can talk about uh, the home. Of course, it's just those of you, of us, who can Afford, us, afford it, we can uh, uh, decorate our offices, our homes. And it's really quite interesting if you just look at, um, at magazines that are about uh, home design and interior design, how much affective talk there is about it. So this is just a 
random choice, uh, um, this one says, you know, enjoy the comforts of home, but there is a lot of talk about, you know, love, coziness, uh, um, so clearly the, the home here is regarded as a kind of ultimate affective niche. So it seems that then this picture here does not really appropriately capture these cases of uh, affective scaffolding. Of course, sometimes this happens, you know, we just go, go around in the world and we encounter things which change our affective state. But this image is not all there is to, you know, the situated idea of affectivity. What I've tried to suggest is that in the case of affective scaffolding, it's more something like this, that we do things to the world which then, which then do things back to us. And of course, this image is still a bit misleading because it suggests that the organism, as it does so, is outside the world. So, of course, that's not the case. The organism manipulates the world from within the niche and constructs the, the niche um, by being uh, in it and involved in this process already. Okay, so now I want to move on to the idea of incorporation. And I think of incorporation as a limiting case of the phenomenon of scaffolding. And I'm gonna, so the rest of my talk is gonna be phenomenological mainly. And uh, by incorporation, here I refer to cases where the scaffold is experienced as part of oneself. And it seems to me that we can distinguish at least three cases. So sometimes we experience scaffolds as part of our sense of identity, sometimes as part of our bodily selves, and sometimes as part of our habitual practices. And I should say I'm still not entirely happy with this division and terminology, but uh, so far that's the best I've been able to come up with, so I'm very well, much welcome your comments and feedback on this. So I'm gonna now go, um, I, you know, I'm gonna explain each of these points in turn, starting with this idea that uh, uh, scaffolds can be part of one sense of identity. And in fact, I've come up with this um, division because there is already quite a lot about, uh, that has been written about this. And we can begin with William James, who in the chapter on the self, in the Principles of Psychology, wrote uh, towards the beginning, really, he says, a man's self is the sum total of all that he can call his, not only his body and his psychic powers, but his clothes and his house, his wife and children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his lands and yacht and bank account. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so all these things give him the same emotions. Yeah, I'm not sure what a wife would say about that. <laughs> but then he continues, he says, if they wax and prosper, he feels triumphant. If they dwindle and die away, he feels cast down. Not necessarily the same degree for each thing, okay? <laughs> but in much the same way for all. So I interpret this passage as claiming that we come to regard certain objects as people as part of who we are, in particular as part of our experienced social identity. And the passage also interestingly suggests that the sign that this is the case is that we feel towards these objects and people, well, the same way we feel towards ourselves, our body and mind. And these objects that we regard as constituting our identity affect or matter to us in specific ways, unlike other objects with which we interact and toward which we might also experience some emotion, for example. So interestingly, there has been actually um, empirical evidence supporting this claim. So uh, there is empirical support from socioeconomic psychology and consumption studies. And here, this is a field also I, I want to explore in more detail, but just to mention some early uh, studies. So Prellinger, uh, he asked the subjects to sort items depending on their relation to the self. And he found that subjects listed possessions and productions as mostly related to the self, just after body parts, psychological processes, and personal identifying characteristics. And uh, later also, Chisten Mihai, and uh, it's the same, it's the flow, flow guy, and uh, Rochberg Halton, they did a study where they went around people's homes and they asked them to talk about ob objects that were special to them and why they were special. And again, they found support for the idea that some people regard certain objects as special because they regard them as part of who they are. They help them define themselves in mainly social, social terms. And this, these studies are also mentioned by Russell Belk to support his idea that possessions extend the self. So 
So notice the 1988 date, for those of you who are familiar with extended mind view, uh, so much earlier, someone already talking about uh, extension of uh, not the mind, but the self, which is obviously kind of related. Um, so Belk also refers uh, to other sources of empirical evidence for this claim. For example, evidence that when people lose cherished, cherished possessions, say in an earthquake or in a fire or in a burglary, they feel a diminishment of their selfhood, which is also, he argues, why in certain institutions such as prisons or concentration camps, it is common practice to take personal items away from, uh, from inmates. And well, as James already noted, uh, this kind of evidence could be interpreted in a kind of simple utilitarian or instrumental way. So you can say, well, we value our possessions because they enable us to do a variety of things, and losing them bring us sorrow or even depression because we lose the ability to do those things. Uh, but James thought that this instrumental interpretation did not explain why losing certain objects comes with the experience of deep loss and personal attack and also a sense of violation. And so to quote him again, uh, he wrote that uh, when certain kind of possessions are taken away from us, we feel a sense of shrinkage of our personality, a partial conversion of ourselves to nothingness. So I think, so that's just the concluding this section of the idea that some objects can be incorporated or integrated, taken into our sense of personal social identity. And now I want to move on to another case of incorporation, which seems to me to be different. And it's the one I'm gonna talk about in, in more, more detail, the one I'm gonna spend uh, more time on, whereas the point three is gonna be really quite short. So I want to talk about how sometimes we incorporate or integrate objects uh, into our bodily selves. So here I'm gonna go straight into phenomenology and talk about, again, a case we've heard about already. Uh, Merleau-Ponty famously talked about uh, how we can integrate objects into what he called the, the body schema, and one of his examples is the example of the blind person's cane. So the claim here is that the person who is skilled, the blind person who is skilled at using the cane, she come to experience the cane as, as part of her own body, as part of her sensory motor skills, as part of what uh, um, Merleau-Ponty called the body schema, a set of implicit habitual bodily capacities. And um, this is also signified or well indicated by the fact that the, the, apparently the blind person doesn't experience anymore the, op the, the cane as a kind of external object, and so she kind of she's, uh, she forgets about the sensation between the hand and the cane. That kind of sensation is passed over; it becomes transparent, and rather she experiences the world at the tip of the cane. So there is a, even a kind of a movement, a, ch a change in the locus of sensation. So in this case, we can say that the boundaries of his lived body, well, of the person's lived body, expand to include the cane. OK, so what does this have to do with affectivity? Well, there is a kind of general sense where you say, well, uh, as the blind person learns to use the cane, the world begins to affect her in different ways. But um, to, to bring affectivity to the fore in this kind of examples, I'm gonna propose a different one. And I'm gonna do so by talking about shoes. So I want, uh, so consider, you know, this, I don't know if you can see, so this is, you know, st sturdy hiking boot, and this is a kind of a tennis shoe with a flat sole. And imagine that there are two hikers that are on the top of a mountain, and they need to walk down the mountain, and in fact, there is a kind of a steep path which is very slippery with gravel on top. And imagine that these two hikers have exactly the same kind of bodily skill and fitness. But one is wearing this kind of boot, and the other one is wearing this. So it seems to me that because of this different item, because of how these different shoes are incorporated, uh, they will show up, they will um, open up the world to the hikers in different ways. So different incorporated artifacts will change the way in which the world affects the hikers by changing their sensory motor abilities. So the person who is wearing the sturdy hiking boots uh, will feel that she can easily walk down the path. She will feel confident. She will thereby experience the path as down walkable, as perhaps even inviting. 
Whereas if you're wearing the other kind of shoe, that perhaps the path actually looks very treacherous to you, it looks dangerous, it's not inviting. So the world will affect you very differently depending on how you, uh, well, depending on the kind of objects you have incorporated. And borrowing a terminology from uh, ecological psychology, if I think we can say that there is a change in effectivity here, which is uh, so a change in what the person can do and perhaps also a change in an implicit sense of what the person can do, which changes the affordances that the person perceives. So the world even acquires different affective qualities in virtue of the different incorporations. So the, the world is dangerous or scary, the path is dangerous or scary to the person wearing these shoes, whereas the world is uh, inviting and the path is uh, maybe fun and yeah, inviting if you're wearing these other shoes. So now I want to talk about another case, which is always, I think, a case of incorporation into the bodily self. Um, this is, it seems to me, it's a case that uh, comes up because our bodily self is not just the sensory motor body, but it's also the expressive body. So I think that artifacts can be incorporated into one's experienced expressive body, meaning they can be integrated into the experience of one's own body as giving form or articulating an affective state. And I think the best example here is the one of um, an instrumental musician. We've seen nice uh, videos uh, in David's talk. Um, here I don't have a violinist, but a saxophone player. And it seems to me that at least sometimes musicians do pick up instruments to work through a certain affective state, to um, achieve a certain affective state that they would not otherwise be able to achieve. Um, so there is a sense in which they pick up the instrument to give form or articulate a certain affective state. You might imagine someone picking up their instrument to, I don't know, to work through a certain mood of nostalgia. And it seems to me that when this happens, the instrument is experienced a bit like the cane, not just as an external object, but as something that is taken into the experience of oneself as, a, as an affect articulating bodily self. So perhaps this point can be made um, more clearly by comparing the case of the instrumental musician with the one of a kind of naked body. So you have a dancer here who is, I, I, well, I don't know what the dancers here will say, but you know, perhaps there are cases in, in which dancers just dance to articulate, give form to a specific affective state. And in those cases, they don't experience their body as an object, but they experience their body as kind of um, means for expression, and they're as, yeah, subjective uh, tools for expression. And it seems to me that the difference between this case and this case, you know, is really not, not very big. Uh, the musician, I propose, experiences the instrument very much like the dancer experiences her limbs. So the, 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 the instrument becomes a part of this experienced, again, expressive, affect-articulating um, body. And this example also allows me to clarify why, why I think of the case of incorporation as being of a limiting case of uh, the general uh, phenomenon of scaffolding. So let me say something about this, and I want to talk here about pizza. So, <laughs> just to stick to stereotypes. Uh, so I, well, okay, I'm in, in Italian, living in England, right? And uh, sometimes I get a bit depressed during winter weekends, um, rainy, misty, short days. So I definitely, you know, I've developed the habit of making pizza to regulate my mood. I, I get a bit depressed and I, I feel better by having a nice, smelly house. I think this is a really nice case of affective uh, scaffolding. I regulate my mood by doing something to the environment, which then does something back to me. But it doesn't seem to me, as much as I like pizza, that I experience the pizza as part of my bodily self. In fact, <laughs> I'm very much aware of the pizza as outside my body, as an object of my attention, even, you know, even if I swallow, when I swallow it, actually. And it seems to me that this case is different from the case of the musician where the musician arguably experiences the instrument as part of himself, of his expressive body. So that's why I think this is a kind of limiting case. So of course it's a case of scaffolding, but it's a very particular one where the scaffold is experienced as part of the, um, of the, yeah, the bodily self, whereas in this case it's just, just a case of affective scaffold, or at least that's what uh, I'm proposing. So third case then of incorporation into the bodily self, 
This is a case of incorporation into the body image. So here I take body image to refer to our sense of how our body appears to other people. So imagine then here the case of a fashion conscious person. So someone who always carefully chooses how to dress and accessorize in social occasions. And just to again go back to that book I mentioned by Kaufman, actually one of the quotes of those women was, you know, I have chosen my handbag as a prolongation of my silhouette for a perfect image. So clearly, you know, this very strong awareness that uh, the, the bag is incorporated in how we look to others. So imagine that a person like that, whenever she believes she's appropriately, dre appropriately dressed, she feels confident, interacts smoothly with others, she's cheerful and funny. And on the other hand, when she does not wear what she thinks is appropriate, she feels upset, she feels out of place. So it seems to me in such a case we can say that the person's self-confident and cheerful affective state includes the incorporation of her clothes and her handbag into this time her body image. So her experience of how others see her body. And here maybe we can then make a comparison again with the naked body. So maybe the confident, likewise the confident bodybuilder, say, experiences his body as strong and attractive to others in a kind of pre-reflective way, as something that enables him confidently to inhabit the world and his interactions with other people. And I think the case of the fascist fashion conscious person is analogous, with the only difference that here it is the clothed body that is experienced as confidence enabling. Okay, so I've concluded now the section of uh, incorporating, or the, the fact that objects can be incorporated uh, into one's bodily self. And I want to then conclude by talking very briefly about this other case. So when objects can be incorporated into one's habitual practices, and I introduced this category because some people have gotten back to me about the pizza. And some people say, no, but the pizza, why do you think the pizza is, is not part of yourself? Um, they didn't seem to be quite convinced by that uh, distinction between the, me making the pizza and the instrumental musician playing his <coughs> instrument. But I, think still, I still think it's not incorporated into my bodily self. But I can see, now I can see why some some people were initially reluctant. I think there is then perhaps a kind of incorporation here, but incorporation is into my habit to self-regulate my mood on gray, misty weekend. In fact, it's definitely the case that there is something missing if I do not make pizza on gray, misty weekends. There is definitely a lack there, which is uh, um, waiting for a kind of compensation. So it seems to me that it's true that in this case, you know, some objects are just incorporated into the things we do, and it's just us plus the object that all together characterizes certain practices. But I still think that that's not the same as, as saying that the pizza is incorporated into my bodily self. Um, and of course, addictions are like that, right? You, you uh, create a relation to an object, a kind of affective scaffolding, where the object now becomes entirely incorporated into, into your practice, and which is also why you know, you might uh, not be able to begin your day at the office without having lots of coffee because there is a certain practice that has been established there, which, you know, if the object is missing, there is a lack that calls for a kind of compensation. All right, so I don't know how much time I'm, I've left, but uh, I, I can just now <coughs> recap what I said and uh, move on to the outstanding questions. So, um, what I did then is begin by talking about the field of situated cognition, by saying, well, this is very nice, but we also need to talk about affectivity. And in particular, my question has been, how is affectivity situated in the world? Where the world here was narrowly understood as material objects in our vicinity, things that we can manipulate. And I have uh, um, mentioned that in order to situate affectivity, we need to say something more than just saying that affectivity is somehow changed and caused by bodily events, sorry, war events in the world and encounters with those events in the world. I have um, uh, suggested that affectivity is situated in the sense that it is scaffolded. And also, as a limiting case, I've talked about how sometimes affective scaffolds can be incorporated by, by what I, by what, by which I meant that they can be integrated into first our sense of identity, then also our sense of the bodily self, and finally about our habitual practices. 
So now I just very briefly want to move on to this general, very general and a bit kind of uh, so general that I, I, I'm almost embarrassed uh, to raise these outstanding questions, but I just think this is the perfect audience uh, to, to um, ask them. So I'm just gonna do that. So one question I have is what, uh, what is the relationship with, with, uh, between what I've said so far and what uh, in the humanities and social, scientists, social science is known as the affective and material terms? which I, I should say, I think it's a matter of uh, so sociological interest that in spite of having worked on emotion for a long time, in my field of philosophy of emotion, philosophy of affective science, I never encountered these uh, terms, affective term and material term. And the reason why I've encountered them, I think, is because I'm in a department of sociology, philosophy, anthropology, where then I've uh, interacted with people who talked about this. And it was a kind of revelation. But you know, all the conferences I've been is never, never mentioned, so they're really separate fields. And so I've started to wonder, okay, maybe what I'm saying is, uh, is completely obvious. Some other people have thought a lot about affectivity and materiality for, in fact, 20 years already. So am I just uh, what in Italian we say, you know, the discovery of hot water, where you're just, <laughs> it's just not, not very interesting or relevant. So I do have a question, which I'm trying to, you know, find an answer to. Can philosophy of cognitive science and what I've said so far, can this field of situated cognition and the idea of scaffold add anything new and valuable to debates that have been taking place in those fields? And so far, I found it actually quite hard to answer that question because in that field, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the notion of affect that is being used is, um, is quite different from the one that I've used, the notion of affectivity I've used, uh, is also different from how psychologists of emotion use the term affect. And often the term affect is not, doesn't even have a psychological connotation in these fields. So I think to me there is an interesting question of how these fields uh, interrelate, if they can actually talk to each other, or they just belong to different traditions, uh, etc. And I'm really, you know, I've been, if you want to talk to me about that, I'd be very grateful. So then I actually am gonna turn the question that Simon wanted me to answer to you. So what is the relation to art and cultural practices between, um, yes, of what I said so far? Because obviously art and cultural practices make a, you know, widespread use of objects and artifacts. And to me the interesting question is how are those experienced? And I've been able uh, to go to some of the exhibitions where there is a lot about experimentation about how we feel and explore the world, which is really fascinating. But I'm interested in you know, a kind of deeper phenomenological understanding. You know, how are we feeling this thing? What does it mean, for example, to um, interact with a sphere and experience an internal sound? So um, is it useful to distinguish the general case, for example, of scaffolding from the more specific one of incorporation? Can it help us understand the use of objects in these practices? And is it useful to also distinguish different modalities of incorporation? So that's a question that I ask to uh, I ask uh, artists. Uh, I'd be very interested to to know what you what you think. And I seem to have been quite quicker than I thought. So, but this is the end. And uh, well, thank you for your attention.